is my guru show where gurus from the areas of art travel creative activism wellness and the spa share their infinite wisdom and maybe a glass of wine Fridays at 3 p.m. right here on Hear Women Talk Radio. Hello, race fans. This is Jeff Gilder, creator of RacersReunion.com. When you're in Myrtle Beach, check out my favorite, the Caravelle Resort. The Caravelle Resort has a golf department and concierge with golf privileges at virtually every course on the Grand Strand, including the coveted Dunes Club. And ladies, pamper yourself with Caravelle's Studio Spa. Featuring services such as Swedish massage, heated stone therapy, reflexology, manicures, pedicures, facials, and more. Awaken your senses with the most requested massage and spa therapies. The Caravelle Resort, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, 800-507-9145. Get the best rate on the Grand Strand when you use promo code RACERS at thecaravelle.com. 800-507-9145. Hi. I'm Annette Martin. My show, Annette Martin's Psychic World, is all about you. Call or use chat to talk with my intriguing guests or ask me an on-air psychic question. Every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, we will have an expert with words of wisdom to assist you with your life. So sit back, relax, and listen to Annette Martin's Psychic World on HearWomenTalk.com. Hi, my name is Jesse Jordan with Further Faster Initiatives, and you're listening to Hear Women Talk Radio. Psychics, find me. Welcome back, everyone. This is Kelly Snyder with Valerie Graham, and our special guest today is uh, Tracy D. Gabrielle Montoya. And uh, just before we left for break, um, you were talking about one of your memorable cases. I did want to find out, uh, give us an example of something that was uh, uh, a little bit more disturbing than the one you just talked about. You know, I don't even—I don't even know if I have one more disturbing than that. But I have one that's—I have several, a lot actually that are probably just as just as uh, okay. disturbing. But um, you know, one of the things that people—and I, this is—you know, obviously, if there's police officers listening or going to listen, or you, Kelly, I mean, this is has no reflection on on your profession or you guys at all. But there's been several cases where um, the the person I've had to look at, unbeknownst to me, was a police officer. And it turns out that they weren't, clearly weren't what they should have been. Uh, One example is um, I had a a detective in Ohio fax me a writing sample once, and he said, I've never used your services, so I want to test your abilities on on this particular sample. And Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So as as the fax is coming in, I tell him, I said, well, this guy is violent, aggressive, could easily kill somebody and can't be trusted. And he said... Well, what would you say if I told you he's a highly respected and decorated sheriff's deputy? I, and I said, I don't give a damn what he does for a living. And he said, well, I don't believe you, and I'm not going to use you. I said, okay, have a great day. About six months later, he emailed me, and he said, here's the mugshot of that cop. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, what did he do? And he said, I owe you an apology. He shot his girlfriend at close range in the head. Oh, my. And wow. so there's been well. several police officers that have been, you know, unfortunately <laughs> on, well, that, on of, that side of my fence. It sort of begs the question, why did he send it to you in the first place? Was it a test that well, he I, didn't realize he had screwed up his own test or what? Well, I think what what it was was, I, now he's one of my, you know, major clients, but I think I think what it was was he just picked somebody, like a, a quick co-worker type thing, just sure, for example, sure. he, you know, had okay. close to him and just sent it to me, you know, figured he'd pick the star of the department. <laughs> you know, that didn't work out too well for him. I think it backfired on him. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, it obviously did, and... You know, when when you were first starting to explain it, I was thinking you were going to say it was the the guy that was sending it to you. It was that's his what I thought too. Yeah. Yes. So I, uh, I I guess you know it was uh, two surprises there. What say I want to send 
I know I'm writing something down and say the police have asked me to give them a handwriting sample um, you know I can write it any way I want I can write it upside down sideways is it still something where I'm going to no matter how hard I try make a mistake uh, and actually have it come back to where it can be shown that I've still written this even though I'm going out of my way to do it differently than I normally would Yes, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, when you try to be deceptive, your subconscious always rats you out. I've actually right. worked on uh, forgery cases where my only known sample is on um, ketchup, on the hood of a car with ketchup. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Is this a... Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Ha- Hamburglar-related incident? <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, isn't it? It's like, that's the only sample you guys could find one? Well, sorry, that's it. I'm like, okay, I'll work with okay. what I have, but... <laughs> oh. It was, you know, it doesn't matter what it's written with, if it's spray painted or if it's, you know, written with, you know, sidewalk chalk or... Or illegible, even if it's illegible it too, so to speak. Uh-huh. doesn't matter. Right, because if forensically you'll look at the entrance and exit strokes and, and you'll look at, you know, the size of loops, the location of eye dots, the shape of eye dots. You're looking at things that are more consistent, where somebody who doesn't know anything about it just kind of visually says, oh, well, that looks the same, yes, without ever really yes. forensically looking at it, so... That's what gives them away. Well, one of the one of the samples that came up, and this this has been absolutely beaten to death in the media, and uh, I don't know what the answer is, but the the letter or note that was written uh, by the Ramses, uh, and, the John Bonet <laughs> case. Yeah, in the John Bonet mm-hmm. case, but I mean, it was there was a, a great deal of controversy as to whether or not she wrote it, or you know the uh, the alleged. You know, intruder wrote it. Uh, did you? I know you. Don't, I don't think you worked on that case. At least I don't know that you did. But uh, that that is a perfect example of a letter that should be brought to someone of your capability. What What's the deal on that? Well, I think what what happened was I couldn't work on it because I was um, I had a relationship as far as a close friendship with one of the detectives on the case. So I was it was a conflict of interest for me. But um, I. I looked at it, and honestly, um, here's, I get this question, I think, probably every class I've, I've ever taught since it, that case occurred. Um, I personally believe that the mother wrote the note, but I believe she used her non-dominant hand. And I, then so automatically people will say, well, do you think she killed her? I said, no, I didn't say that. My job stops at the note, you know, and... Um, when I when I re- when I did my you know some of my little magic tricks, I would reverse things and put them over and do overlays and things like that, and with different lights, it really looked a lot like Patsy's writing with the non-dominant hand. So, which is why some people that looked at it couldn't come to a conclusion because I don't know that they were looking at different angles like that. I knew for a fact when Don Mark Carr came up and tried to say that he did it, I, I looked right. at that right away and I said, there's no way he did it. That doesn't even remotely closely match. So I knew for a fact that wasn't, that was just some kind of farce. I don't know what that was, but there's all kinds of people that will go out there and confess the things that they didn't do for whatever their notoriety purposes sure. are. But, well, yeah, I mean, it was um, somewhat proven that he ended up being brain dead, so it doesn't really matter what his purpose was. But anyway. Right, right. You had worked a bit on the Michael Jackson case. What what did you end up doing? I, I was actually hired by the defense team. This is when he was accused of that molestation and yes. different things. Um, I actually worked on the defense team, and my job was to look at his personality and find out, you know, kind of what's in there. You know, it's kind of a nutshell analysis. What's all in here? What do we got going on? And um, I saw that based on his writing, he had phallic symbols in his writing. And I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't, I don't watch a lot of the media because I, I do get involved in a lot of the higher profile cases. So I really don't watch a lot of the news and things. Um, so I really didn't know much about Michael Jackson at all, really, uh, since, you know, the Jackson 5. <laughs> but sure. um, So I looked at that and I saw he had a lot of phallic symbols in his writing and that, when I measured it, it took it back to the time when he was 12 to 13 years old, and that showed me that he was molested by a Jackson family male when he was about 12 or 13 years old. Oh so my. his emotional his emotional intimacy was stunted at that age, and so therefore he he 
immediately identifies with that age group. And so I told them, I said, well, I don't know that I'd be good for your defense because I believe he's guilty. But I don't think that prison's the answer. I think that we need to treat the, the, the victimized child first and then work on it from the inside out. Right. But um, apparently it took care of itself either way. But, um, but that one, and then I worked on the missing baby Gabriel case as well. Right. Well, that was a case we worked together, so... What mm-hmm. what did you have as a sample of that for that particular case? Uh, they all came. At, they the news when they all I was just ransacked by the news stations at the house. They all brought the uh, custody papers and different things from Tammy Smith and then from both uh, the parents. And honestly, gosh, I really I prayed that I'm wrong on this one, but I'd be surprised. I would be surprised if she didn't hurt hurt him. I really would be, because she's, she that? she's got violence all over her, her all over her handwriting, her writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's got weapons and knife blades up in her in her upper zone, which shows that she's capable of thinking, um, you know, of harming people. And then she's got them in her lower zone, which shows that she's capable of following through. Wow, that's a yeah. She's also got a lot of mental illnesses showing. Huh? Well, yeah, she's already proven that just by, you know, having her speak on TV. I mean, she's uh, she's definitely got some of those uh, those those issues. But didn't we have? Uh, I, mean, Valerie, I don't even, uh, I don't watch, I don't yes. even watch that stuff either. I, well, it, yeah, I mean, with if if we have a moment, you had done this incredible. We touched on at the beginning the handwriting formation therapy HFT that you uh, were very successful in the juvenile probation research. I wish you would share that with us a little bit. Uh, okay, I I um, was contacted by the executive director of the uh, Texas Juvenile Probation Commission, uh, Vicki Spriggs, and uh, she, her, and I go back professionally for about ten years now. But in '06, the legislative session had met, and Texas is every other year. They had met, and they said, you know. Uh, we need to do something with these kids because we have these heavy hitters, hard to treat children that have failed at every single uh, type of traditional therapy that the state has to offer. And we either we have two choices: we either try something else because this stuff's not working, something completely different, or we let them just discharge, knowing that they're probably highly likely to end up in the adult system. So I said, well, you know, I can you know I can work with my handwriting information therapy program. I created it in eighty seven and it's made you know, I have clients all over the world from ages nine to ninety nine that have changed their lives and are very happy. I said I you know, it's never been applied in this type of a setting, but I'm more than willing to do it. So the goal of it was to reduce recidivism rates and that was in it was a six month program where the kids remained hundred percent anonymous. I worked through their probation officers and Every six months, the state runs their backgrounds, and so far, that was all six. So far, none of them have reoffended. Well, you also mentioned that you, you know that their grades, their self confidence, their social skills, oh, yeah. everything improved. Everything improved. A lot of them were um, discharged from probation for good behavior. Um, there's even some judges now that have been known in random states, one in Colorado for sure, I can think of off the top of my head, that when the kids go and see him the first time in, that, you know, the first time in front of a judge for some sort of crime, the judge asks for proof that he's, that they're enrolled in this type of program, and oh, the judge God. will give them a lighter sentence. Well, it, you had quite an impact there. Definitely, and I, I'm looking forward to trying it in other settings, too, as far as a big bulk culture like that. This year, we're going back to the legislator, we're, we're legislative committee, and we're trying to put um, to what they would like to put 100 kids through, so we'll see what we can do. Well, one of the things uh, before we end the show today, I, I wanted to find out, uh, I, nothing that you do is geographically limited. I mean, it just seems like no matter... Who contacts you from anywhere in the world? You can assist them as long as you have, you know, the basics uh, in order for you to do the analysis. Is that correct? That is correct. In 